Oi, pessoal, tudo bem? Quem escutou o 23º episódio do podcast já estava aguardando essa entrevista aqui na íntegra. E para você que ainda não escutou, corre lá. Está disponível no YouTube e em todos os canais de streaming. É só procurar Octopus Discos, beleza? Fiquem aí com esse momento incrível em que eu tive a grande honra de entrevistar o mestre Luigi Braima. E aproveitem essa verdadeira aula de música. First of all, thank you very much for being here. Uh, no I'm problem. so honored. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for being able to, to en engage the music, love the music, and respect it. Because, you know, we're in a time where a lot of people don't do those three things, you know? Music still lives, you know what I'm saying? Recording still lives. With people like yourself that will continuously be a vessel for us as musicians and artists, continue to maintain our work, our livelihood, and our craft. So thank you. I want to start with where you came from. You were born in Ghana. I was born in Ghana, raised in East St. Louis, Illinois. East St. Louis is a small village in Illinois that uh, has about probably 300,000 people, 200,000 oh. people, but a very special area because This area is one of the first places where the actual drum djembe was was dropped into. So there was two places when the djembe left West Africa to come to America. And one was in New York, the other one was East St. Louis. And that mm -hmm. being because of people like Harry Belafonte and Catherine Dunham. So there were two gentlemen to come to America to make, to, to make a base as their country, their new residence, and to make a living. And that was in 1967, 64. Laji Kamara was in New York, which is a legendary djembe player. And Morcham was in East St. Louis, which is a legendary djembe player as well. There are truly a, like true blessings to have introduced the world of West African drumming, to djembe drumming to the West, those two gentlemen. Your family is very traditional and they are musicians yes your, yes your mother your father yes. so can you can you tell us about yeah, yeah. this both sides of my family are musicians right my dad's a drummer and composer who was a legendary composer and um drummer from ghana and then my mother being a legendary jazz drummer and funk drummer who learned from her father who's a legendary jazz drummer named Weedy Mars, Nathaniel Weedy Mars. Now, out of their family, they were all from an area in New Orleans called the Uptown area from New Orleans. And in New Orleans, there was 10 brothers and sisters. Five of those brothers and sisters were drummers. My grandfather being the eldest out of all, and then my uncle, which was named Leo Mars, was the baby. Now. Leo Mars became to be one of the most famous drummers to come out of New Orleans. His name is Idris Muhammad. You know, I'm really here because of the drum, which I can honestly say that I'm a walking vessel of it because both parents, both families, both entities are very, very exceptional drummers. Matter of fact, for me, I call it a blessing to be a, uh, to live a life where I have parallel lives of music. I was reading uh, about the Jim B. Mm -hmm. And I'm very curious because people say that this instrument has three spirits. So can you explain to us? We're not just going to talk about djembe. Let's just talk about drums plural before we get to the instrument. Okay. Djembe has a nature or drums has a nature to bring forth energy. No matter where you go in the diaspora, where you're in Brazil, you're in Africa, you're in Ghana, you're in anywhere where the diaspora is, from Africa to America and every yeah. other places in between, you're gonna find a way when you're talking about drums that are that are truly direct descendants for me. I can't speak for anything else, but there are direct descendants from Africa going through the the Caribbean, going through the, the Americas, going, you know, going to New Orleans. You will find that those drums has a way to bring energy down. And if you just look at the, the cause of how energy is created, look at the periodic table. It's the yes. same thing that we use for the periodic table that we use for drums. So if you use that same mythology 
you understand the same science behind why spirit is in drums. Now, the djembe is very unique because of the spiritual possession that they have before colonialization. We're talking mm. before Islam, that these instruments was held for spiritual belief that they had certain powers in it, which if you ask the old, old djembe folas, they know how to possess that, that they understand how to make the shifts, the elements, to change emotions, to make things better, to make certain ideas come to pattern. Because if you ask a lot of Jimmy Folders about uh, Jimmy players about those type of things, they'll even say that that's something that's not dealing with Jimmy. Because we're now most people are coming from a theatrical way of playing. They're not, you know, what I'm saying. I mean, if you go to areas like in Mali, you see a very traditional way how you start playing for the Jenna Forty people music. You start playing for different ceremonies, and the farabanka, the different rhythms that are played that are able to bring something out of that, that can tell the story of the people and of the instrument of spirituality. But a lot of people don't understand that because of the way the instrument shifted throughout colonialism, throughout times changing, mm -hmm. the evolution. Mm -hmm. And so the instrument, the tradition is still there throughout West Africa, but sometimes because of colonialism, things have changed. But what's really unique, they definitely find a way to keep, it's almost like how you can see in Santeria and some areas in Candomblé, how they bring both sides together. Yes. It's, it's the same way, you, exactly, mm -hmm. it's the same way. But the instrument itself, has his own truth and his own voice. When I first listened to your uh, debut album, Hands of Time, I said, I hope it was good. I was suddenly taken to another place, like another atmosphere. It's, it's such a spiritual and, and powerful. In some parts, you are in a place that is so traditional, talking to the ancestors through the music. So it's something that go yes. inside you in such a powerful way and you know how to talk with the modern music too amazing it, it wasn't easy and, and the reason why what it wasn't easy and what made it easy number one as a djembe fola as a djembe player in in the west in america to be a djembe drummer if you're not in a djembe situation dealing with folkloric African dance and drumming or anything dealing with African music, then your job, you're the first one fired and the last one hired because of the respect level that the instrument has. I've been blessed to be able to play and work with a lot of musicians and bands, legendary and amazing musicians as a djembe player. Right. I mean, you know, with my brother Zion, uh, formerly known as Christian Scott Atun Diagua, um, Trombone Shorty, um, Mike League of Snarky Puppy, um, Ghost yeah. Note, all these amazing musicians. Yes. And I was able to find a way not just to be a percussionist, but okay. a Jimmy Fola. I was able to put together an ensemble of people who understands both narratives, who can speak both languages in traditional African music of some type and in Western music. So it's not easy to find a musician who can understand how to play Malinke music and how to play yeah. jazz. You know, there's songs on the album where we were able to blend the worlds. It wasn't easy to find musicians who were able to play yes. all these, uh, like, you know, all these different sounds, whether it's from Brazil, from Cuba, from West Africa, and then say, now let's play some funk and then find a way to blend these worlds, to just blend them naturally, not blend them like, no, no, no. Simultaneously at the same time, find a way to make the marriage work. This is pretty difficult. It's very difficult. It's very difficult because what happens here is that if you tell a drummer, from the states that play maracatu rhythms or if you tell a drummer uh, from the states that play um a certain rhythm that deals with with samba and then they'll say okay now within that right now play on top of clave from cuba 
Sulu for Mali. Now, how do you make that marriage fit from creating all those realities that I just said into a song? Yes. I, I was amazed when I first listened. I was, oh my God, how does he do this? That is because of my band. I would be nothing without my band. Hands of time. The hands of time. Everyone in that band are people who went through the same struggles that I went through. They wanted to play folkloric African music, but they had to find a way to make a living when playing with funk band, jazz band, or fusion yes. band. Yeah. So they was like, man, one day, why don't we create, a, you know, one day it would be able to be cool to see us create our own narrative. I was able to find musicians who I had a very close relationship throughout the years. I mean, about from 15 to 20 years of friendship and playing music together. Uh, Munir Saki, Luke Coranta, Sheikh Ndoy, Shea Pierre, Sam Dickey, Raja Cassis, Courtney Smith were musicians that if you were to ask them to create who they were musically, you, this would, would be it. So when I put the band together, it was really, it was very interesting to see what people wanted to see what my sound was because they know they've seen me in different spaces with different bands. It'd be like in one minute you see me with a jazz band, next minute you see me with a folklore group, and next thing you see me with a funk, uh, a, a funk group, next you see me with a rumba ensemble, Brazilian ensemble, and be able, and the cool thing is with an instrument like djembe, because it has a unique voice, how am I able to find a way to play this music without stumping on the musicians that go with it? So I said to myself, if I'm able to play all these genres of music from around the diaspora with an instrument that's really directly traced to West Africa from being born in Ghana, because Jimmy has nothing to do with Ghana, but being raised in America and trying to find a way to use that same instrument to connect boundaries. I said, if this can happen, then I found a way to create a voice for an instrument that's not directly um, narrated for my, my language and my vernacular, but find a way to use it to learn this narration to be able to connect people and, mus and, and, mus and musicians with different forms of musicality. Hence, that's why the band is called The Hands of Time. You came to Brazil in the past. I right? came to Brazil twice. Twice. And how was your experience here? I have a huge fan base in Brazil for, for hand drummers, from a lot of chimbao players. Hand drumming in Brazil is probably some of the most amazing, amazing things I have ever seen live. And it was a trip because I did, I first went there on vacation with me and my wife. We first yeah. went there on vacation. And i never forget, because she got mad at me because I wanted to play more than vacation. <laughs> but I'm like, you know, I'm like, okay. So when we got to Brazil, the first place we were in Sao Paulo. It was in Sao Paulo. And um, I met up with a friend of mine by the name of Andre Priuca. Andre has a group, Horoya. So Andre was like, yo, man, you know, well, you need to do, you should do a workshop or you should play or you should do a show, man. I say, was your band playing? Yeah, we're going to play on this night. I say, bro, I got to play with your band. We got to do it. Yeah, man, mm -hmm. let's do it. So I sat in and I played with, it was a night with me and Andre. We played together and it was so amazing because I got to hear his band. And it's so unique is that his band thinks like the way we think because in our band, we don't use a drum set. Uh, uh, we yes. don't use a drum set. That's what makes Hands of Time very unique. We yes, created our unique. own instrumentation to drive the music from folkloric sentiments.
Paulo. I love Sao Paulo. Oh my God. <laughs> but then I went to Bahia. Oh my God. <laughs> and that's when I said, Lord have mercy. I went to do uh, a workshop. And, and this is when I realized I didn't know how deep it was for me in Brazil. About, about 20 drummers from different areas like, Oi, weedy. They couldn't believe I was there. And I was like, hey. And they, they, was, they was like, you here? I was like, yeah. One guy, just he couldn't believe it. Just, people could not believe I was there. But then I realized that the Kimbao technique is just like Jimbe playing. And so, you know, for all those guys, it's like, yo, this is, we want you here. I said, well, I'm doing a workshop. Huh? So I did a workshop one day and then the next day i did a workshop it was over like 25 people we didn't even have a place so we went outside i never forget we was in the, like the hills and i did this workshop in the hills it was it was touching and i uh, i i was like wow so they ever say man you must come back you must come back the second time i came back was with christian scott attuned the for the mastercard jazz festival the next time i will come back God willing, will be with my band. And I pray for that. I pray for that too. <laughs> yes. Go to Sao Paulo. Go to Rio. Go to Bahia. Yes. Go to Recife. You know what I'm saying? And um, yeah, I mean, this music for me, I think will be great in a, in a, in a country like that because it, it's one of those countries that really represents the continuum of how the diaspora really was able to yes. create new voices within uh, 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 his own his own narrative that was created out of something, you know what I'm saying? And I, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of this one mm -hmm. guy, Cornelius Brown. I have to meet him because I'm a fan of his work, and I love what he's done. You know, uh, Brazil has a definitely a special place in my heart, and God willing, like I said, I want for us <laughs> to come back there. Are you working on a new album? Yes, the first album really. We were very happy how how good and how the people the response from the first album. It came out September twenty fourth and twenty one, and it's amazing. Still rotating strong. We're almost in another two weeks, one year away from when we released the first single that came out. Ships come in. Yes, yes. It came, it was released June seventeenth. I think June seventeenth. So it's it's gonna be like a very special day when for me because it's the one year anniversary for them when the first single came out a lot of people when we did it wasn't expecting that song to be my first single the band didn't even know they the band didn't even know that was gonna be the, they thought weedy foley would be my first single yes that's wonderful this yeah. is a good example of uh what i said before this uh atmosphere that you you are taking to and talking to the new talking to the old mm -hmm. in a magical connection. This mm -hmm. this this song's amazing. This song yeah, it's amazing. it's very it was interesting because when we first did it, I remember like it was yesterday. We were in LA. It's another song we recorded that weekend. A song called Hippos in Space. It features okay. Christian as well as um Terrence Martin. We did that on a Saturday and on a Sunday. We went to the studio, and one of my the the the, the, the song by set player Munir Zaki, he was sitting there, and we were going over the parts, and he was tired. He was like, "Man, I'm I'm tired. I'm ready to go to sleep." And so when I first did the first layer of the song, he was like, "All right," I said, "Okay, bro." I said, "Watch, this song's gonna be something." <laughs> All right, I gotta see it. I believe it when I see it. I went to Africa. I came back. The pandemic hit. It yeah. was a very sad time because nothing was happening. Yes. But during the pandemic is when I did my album. For musicians, I think this was a very difficult moment. Yeah, at the same time, a chance to evolve. Absolutely. I did so much work during the pandemic that I didn't even think the pandemic had even stopped. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't touring, but where I was doing for the instrument, made me realize that sometimes it's more than just working. It's creating. Because the day will come where it's going to come back. Yes. It's going to come back. And that's where we're at now. So was it a bad idea for me to do an album during the pandemic? It could have been or I could have waited. Had I waited, the, the, the triumph of the album would not have been what it was. 
because I was going through something no different than every person in the world was going through something. So I had to yes. find a way to channel my story, whether it's from my past, my present, and my future at the moment. Because a lot of my friends told me, you got to stop to do this album, bro. If you don't, mm. it's not going to be. All my close friends said, "You, if you're going to do an album, you got to stop, bro. Because I was touring constantly, 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 constantly. Whether with my band or with other projects, I just couldn't stay still. But the pandemic made everybody stop. Yes. Now, it made musicians come together who didn't normally come together. It became a first place where people who had hearts who wouldn't have done the album, they'd be like, you know what? I want to be there for you. So all of those things happened emotionally and spiritually, and it connected mm -hmm. people together. I mean, Trombone Shorty, I'll never forget it. When we did Back to uh, Back to Forward, uh, Ode to Bantuku, we were in his studio, and he was like, he just called me. He said, you ready? I say, huh? I say, you say, you ready? I say, you ready? I say, yeah. I say, come on, man. I'm about to be at my studio in 15 minutes. Don't be late. I said, okay. okay. <laughs> so I go to the studio. He playing. No, no, no. He said, now throw the track on, man. I said, okay. And Charlie, is uh, his, uh, his engineer, he puts the track on. And the first song that I let him listen was Sent For Me which had Pedrito Martinez and Tank from the band Tank and the bangers, bang Terry on the Tank Ball. Yes, they are wonderful. Yes. Yeah, it's a beautiful song. He's listened to the song. He said, well, man, you pretty much, this song done, bro. Only thing you got to do is just mix it. Then I was just playing this song. He says, play that again. I said, well, this song ain't done, man. I still am working on it. He says, play it again. And he's sitting in the chair. And I laughed to myself. I said, if he plays on this song, that will change the song. And I tell you, my sister, he listened to it twice. The third time he started playing along with it. He soloed on trumpet and then start adding stuff. I said, oh my God. Then I said, hey man, can you go to the top and play the beginning? He said, sure I can. He goes to start playing the phrases with the piano players. So now he's not only just playing a solo, he's crafting out where he's trying to make the music come out of what I did already. Sometimes with music, your song can be done. Just gotta know how to have the right instrument to know how to craft it to come to life. And that young man did that. So, you know, Trombone Shorty is one of my close, close, close friends, close friends, just like Christian Scott, like my brothers. And I can honestly say they were able to do things with my songs to give it the emotional content that it was this, this the, the little emotional content that it was there. Spiritually it was there. But emotionally, we still needed something else from another narrative to bring that out. And that's exactly what those musicians did. Everybody that was on that album was able to do that. I mean, from Mumu Fresh to Terry Allen Tankball to Pedrito to Osain Del Monte, Monte to Alain Perez to Trombone Shorty to Corey Henry to Terrence Martin to Pedrito. I mean, all these people were able to bring that spiritual emotion that I needed for each part to come alive. And this is so intense. This album, uh, for me, it's like a planet. This album has his own language and it's very specific. It's like a world itself. Yeah, you it know? is. Absolutely. It's People ask me, well, how are you going to bring that to stage? I said, my hardest thing was how I'm going to bring that to the, to the album because it's more intense life. Because I grew up around traditional African spiritualism, the way we play music for ceremony and where we play music for belief systems and for traditional ways is more intense than if you listen to it on an album. So the okay. fact that I was able to make people go somewhere and feel something from an album is the idea of what I wanted. Now, when I see the people live, it's over with for them because I know how to play for to make make it happen for them yes and it i know how to do that and the musicians around me do too that's the difference from playing music from a core of this i'm going to play the melody to make it sound good because i'm emotionally there but how to do that to make it spiritually emotionally and physically there that's the yes. job of what folkloric drummers will always be at the forefront of music because that's what happens when we play and you were nominated? We nominated for the Grammy. 
um, best jazz solo for my brother, um, Christian Scott Atunji Adjua, on a song called Sako Dugu, along with John Baptiste. Uh, he was nominated. Terrence Blanchard, the great Chick Corea, um, Dave Welko, and John Patitucci on the song. So, I mean, to be in a lineup with those guys for best jazz soloists, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. The Grammy was great. But when Time Magazine said we were oh, yes, yes, 10 yes. albums in 2021, yes. I was, was number, me. yeah, that was number eight. And number seven was Donda by Kanye West. So it's like, that was pretty intense. Yes, yes. And, and this is uh, not so usual. Uh, bringing the percussion to this place. Yes. You know, my main goal in life is to tell people that as a djembe fola, our job is to show people that the instrument has a melody and a voice. We all like the word percussionist, but me, there are people who are percussionists who do their job, who truly are percussionists, whether in a band, whether in a, in a symphony. There's many places that does that. But if you look at Surdu, They say, oh, that's a percussion instrument. You look at Chimbao, that's a percussion. Pandero, that's a percussion instrument. Jimbe, Tama, Sabab, Atabaki, percussion instrument. Okay, it's a percussion instrument. Now, they always say on percussion, within the past five, four years, that's changed for me. They always say now on Jimbe and Congas. And I say that for a reason. If you see me with just a Jimbe, name the instrument as it is. All right. You see, you know what I'm saying? It's like, okay... On percussion. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I can understand if I had a bunch of drums up here. Okay, on percussion. I can respect that. Because you don't want to be on djembe, congas, blah, 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 blah. I can respect that. But if you see me with a djembe, announce me as my job. Because guess what? Majority of people that does the job now, that has happened, what has happened now with being a djembe player, that a lot of people now, because of the, the, the job that myself and my get so and Atiba Warrior, Amadou Kuyate, uh, Munir Zaki, Lu Kuranta, Abu Kamara, Kweku uh, Sumber, all these different people who are great djembe players are now being known and noted as djembe folders or djembe players with the bands because they're not playing other instruments. Yes, yes. This is very curious. Look at the great, you know, the, the great percussionists now from Brazil, or from Cuba. They were notorious for playing conga, notorious for playing chimbao, notorious for playing pandero. And some instrument, they, this was their instrument. But because the narrative of how people define an African aesthetic or Afro-Brazilian, Afro-Cuban aesthetic will change. So it's an insult for me when I have a person that said on on piano, Robert Glasper, on drums, uh, Chris Dave, on, on percussion, Weedy Brainbow. When learning how to speak English, the dictionary says that the piano and the drum set is a part of the what family? Percussion family. Why do we, as Jim Fuller's, have to be known as percussionists when it should be on percussionists? Robert Glasser on percussion, Chris Dave, and on percussion, Weedy Bramer. Those names are very iconic, famous names when you're dealing with the instrument itself. No one knows Pedrito Martinez without his conga or his bata. If you don't, if you call Pedrito Martinez a percussionist, that's great. But that man is one of the greatest congueros and bataleros of our time. This is something you are helping people to understand because they they can't they don't have this understanding. But the thing is there's no way you can use a European narrative to define an African language. The English vernacular cannot define an African narrative. Portuguese narrative cannot define an Afro-Brazilian narrative. Never. It cannot Yes, it can see. use certain words to try to understand, but it has more than what the words say. I say it has more than just saying just that. And if you understand that ideology 
then it starts to change the way you pronounce it and way you speak it and way you use it in your vernacular. The mm -hmm. same way with people when they find out the traditions of what the instrument can do, hence or what it does when you're playing. That's why yes. it's important. That's why this album is always, I'm, all the interviews I've done, I say those things. This is a way to pay respect to the instrument. Yes. There is a, a story there. There is roots there. Absolutely. So it's it's a way of teaching people how to treat the instrument. And I know you you, you are a teacher too. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I teach, I do workshops at different colleges and universities. And I, I try, when I have the time to do it, I go back to doing it. But it's very hard, you know, <laughs> to be a traveling musician. <laughs> yes. But we do it. You know, I'm able to do it with the help of my wife and the uh, musicians in my band. So, yeah, I, I, I'm able to do it. Even if when I'm not teaching, I'm teaching. Because yes. we have to be able to maintain the respect and the and the level of, of diligence that we must have for the instrument. Things change, but sometimes we let go the shine of the instrument, you know? Mm -hmm. You doing this and teaching people the history. So this is amazing. Yeah, that's what the album is. It's a ode to my family, to both musicians and to my teachers and to the drummers who, who pray for the day for something like this to happen and it gets this respect. That's why the last song on the album, Sworn to the Drum, is a is probably the, the most emotional albums I could have ever, songs I could ever did because I'm paying homage to the drummers who changed the way we look in the West about African, Afro-Caribbean culture, Afro-Cuban culture, Afro-diasporic culture, truly, through drums, how this instrument is imperative yes. and how is this important to maintain its traditions, but in different stages, whether it's in, you know, jazz, which is, I hate that word, which is in blues, funk, fusion, hip hop, you know, all those type of things. So those musicians did it. You know what I'm saying? You know, Chief yeah. Bay or Tunji, Mango Santa Maria, Nana Venezuela's, uh, Art Blakey, uh, Laji Kamara, all these people were influ uh, influential and they were hand drummers. They yes. were hand drummers, they were folkloric drummers, you know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. And, and without the them, music will, will not evolve the way it did. Absolutely, absolutely. People must must know that the importance of the instruments Absolutely. Thank you for that. <laughs> Because no this is amazing. This is amazing. And um, are you planning to come? Tell your organizers, your your venues, your festivals. Bring the Weedy Brahma and the Hands of Time to Brazil. If you listen to this podcast or you listen to this this show, tell the people we want come. to see him here. Yes, yes, we would. Brazil, we're coming. See you all soon. We're coming. Now, I don't know when, but <laughs> we're coming. <laughs> yes, we are coming, for sure. I can't wait. Ah, wonderful. Yeah, we're coming. <laughs> we're coming. Thank you for your time, for your kindness, and the lessons you always bring when you are speaking and when you are playing. <laughs> God bless you, your family. See you soon in Brazil. See you soon. God bless you. I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Obrigado. Obrigado. <laughs> tchau, tchau. <laughs>